Welcome everyone. I am Tatsuki Oji, President of the American Ceramics Society. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Murichin Jassim, the 2020 American Ceramics Society Edward Otton Jr. Memorial Lecturer and one of our MSNT plenary lecturers today. The lecture is named for benefactor and visionary professor Edward Otton Jr who was a founder of the American Ceramics Society and started the first ceramics engineering education program in the U.S. at the Ohio State University in 1894. Each year, the selection committee chooses a distinct lecturer noted for scholarly attainment in ceramics or related field. The committee members making this year's selection were Safash Rizbat, Gary Messi, and Jian Wang. I would like to express my deepest appreciation to them for their great work. Dr. Murichin Sen is a chief scientist, Ohio Aerospace Institute, located in Cleveland, Ohio. He received his PhD in metallurgical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology and completed his postdoctoral work at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He is a current president of the World Academy of Ceramics and the past president of the American Ceramics Society. He is a governor of the Atomotelia, academician of the World Academy of Ceramics, and fellow and distinct life member of the American Ceramic Society. He is also a fellow of ASM International, American Association for the Advancement of Science, Indian Institute of Metals, and National Academy of Inventors. Jay is honorary fellow of the European Ceramic Society and Indian Institute of Ceramics, an honorary member of the Material Research Society of India and Indian Ceramic Society. He is distinct life member of the Alpha Sigma Nu. He received honorary doctorate from Nagaoka University of Technology and Slovak Academy of Sciences. Jay is a recipient of the more than 85 national and international awards, including five R&D 100 awards, FLC Technology Transfer, EDI Innovation, two Not Innovation Award, NASA Public Service Medal and Silver Snoopy Award, and numerous NASA Group Achievement Awards. He received Ishika International Carbon Prize, GFC International Prize, and Gottfried Wagner Memorial Award from Japan, Sir Richard Brooks International Award from ESAS, ASM International IMS Visiting Lectureship, Jack Lucas Award from ASM International IMS, and Distinct Engineering Achievement Award, and William B. Johnson Founders Award from Engineers Council. Jay has received several ASAS awards, including the present award, Double David Kingery, John Jepson, Richard M. Furras, Samuel Gadsby Tucker International, James Mueller, Global Ambassador, and Toledo Glass and Ceramics Award. He has received the Indian Institute of Technology Distinct Alamanas Award, International Dressing Bauhausen Award from Germany, Keramas Award from AGH University of Science and Technology, as well as the JFC Curtis Anniversary Special Award. He has also been awarded the 2020 Edward Demir Campbell Memorial Lectureship of ASM International. Dr. Sin is editor or co-editor or also a co-author of many books and book chapters, proceedings, papers and journals. He has developed numerous plenary, keynote and invited presentation in international conferences, forums and workshops and serves on advisory board and committees of more than a dozen prestigious international journals and technical publications. Ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome Dr. Murichin Jassim. Good morning, uh, President Oji, friends and colleagues from all over the world, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank President Oji for a very kind introduction. I would also like to thank uh, Edward Oten Jr. Lecture Selection Committee and uh, Board of Directors for considering me for this uh, prestigious honor. Uh, Professor Oten was the visionary and one of the founders of the society. In this presentation, I would like to talk about uh, additive manufacturing and its Im potential impact on global supply chains and in sustainable development. Uh, as all of you know, sustainable development is an ongoing global challenge 
which we all need to work together to address and solve these problems. I was hoping to have a chance to present this lecture in person and have a discussion and dialogue with uh, all of you as well as other colleagues during MSNT, uh, but the current situation unfortunately doesn't allow that. However, I will be very happy to discuss it uh, afterwards. Uh, to talk about uh, Professor Edward Orton Jr. As uh, many of you uh, may or may not know, he was the first chairman of the School of Ceramic Engineering at Ohio State University, which was started uh, in 1894. And uh, the other interesting uh, point is in, he was also one of the key person out of eight uh, people who started uh, or thought about starting a society which is basically the American Ceramic Society during a 12th annual convention of National Brick Manufacturers Association meeting in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania that was in 1898. And it's very interesting if you have a time I would suggest uh, and recommend uh, some of you. He had written a very good uh, 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 description of how society came into being during uh, the presentation by one of the authors and then they all discussed in the evening you know that they should you know, get together and start society. He also served as the first uh, uh, secretary of the society from 1899 to 1917 for a long time. He was not paid a dime at least according to the records and uh, afterwards uh, he served in the military and uh, did other things but he also served as a president of the American Ceramic Society during 1930 to 1931. This uh, lecture uh, by the society was started in 1933. So here is a brief outline of my presentation. Uh, first of all I would like to give you some background an introduction uh, about uh, some of these uh, additive manufacturing uh, technologies and then briefly touch up on um, uh, sustainability and the manufacturing in general uh, in the global landscape. Uh, then I will uh, present you some of the data in some of the areas we have been involved. Uh, I've been involved in this area last 10 years, more than 10 years. Uh, they are related to ceramic systems, uh, some polymer systems, uh, multi-material systems. And uh, the point I would like to make here is that in order to make some complicated product, uh, you really need to use a number of additive manufacturing technologies, and uh, which basically present a lot of technical challenges and a lot of opportunities. Uh, uh, then I will summarize and conclude my talk. So one of the key approach in additive manufacturing is uh, by going using a layer by layer uh, uh, fabrication method. But if you really look at the literature and follow through different cultures and times, uh, folks have been using uh, different kind of uh, layer wise approaches. So for example, uh, there have been subtractive processes where uh, material is successively removed from a solid block until the desired shape is reached. Then you have a fabricative processes where different types of materials are combined and joined. And then there are formative processes where different forces are basically uh, the heat is applied to material to form it. And then desired shapes such as bending, casting and molding are done. By and then you finally have the additive which of course is started uh, you know, in 1980s where the material is manipulated so that successive pieces of it are combined you know, to make the object, uh, object. So in this additive manufacturing uh, uh, technology landscape, uh, there have been a number of uh, major milestones uh, starting in the 1980s. And uh, in this chart, uh, you can see there have been some major material developments uh, and there have been some process developments in terms of the printer and technology advances. So if you follow from the 1985, uh, there are a number of things done in stereolithography, then there are a number of printers came along. Uh, in the 90s, there are a number of systems, uh, low-cost AM systems were developed in, in all over the world. 
And then in 2014 or 15, there have been real growth in all types of printers. You, know, you can buy a printer of any price, like there is a very low cost printer, desktop printer from few hundred dollars and a few thousand dollars to, you know, you just you know, name it. And they are all available and people are using it all over the world. Similarly, there have been major developments in different kinds of uh, material systems. And these are either the resins or uh, different kind of compatible you know, stereolithography type polymers. So we basically have a, a number of changes and very active field and number of things are you know, really going on. So I would like to take a couple of moments and just briefly point out uh, what happened in this country in the last 10 years. Uh, as some of you may know that uh, in Ju June 2011, there was a, a PCAST uh, report uh, to the president uh, about uh, how to ensure uh, the American leadership in advanced manufacturing. And then there was a national strategic plan for advanced manufacturing, uh, which uh, was developed. Uh, afterwards, uh, we had uh, a number of uh, national uh, network of uh, manufacturing uh, centers, uh, national manufacturing initiative, uh, and that basically put a lot of emphasis on additive manufacturing technologies, providing uh, a lot of support uh, through different uh, mechanisms. As we all know, additive manufacturing is being used uh, in a number of uh, industrial sectors, and that includes from food to consumer products and pharmaceuticals and healthcare, as well as in industrial energy infrastructure and transport. And there is these technologies basically, if they are used properly, they can avoid the need to hold uh, spare inventory. They can reduce the warehousing cost and overstocking. And they can also provide uh, new production techniques, which are really responsive to local needs, as well as uh, yield f flexible production capabilities. And the, their impact is basically fairly huge. Now they can provide the transformative products, efficient production to reduce demand for raw materials, and also reduce the need for global distribution and supply chains, because then you can basically make on-demand flexible production. And uh, at this point, I would like to make a, a quick comment that uh, global uh, additive manufacturing community has really stepped up to the plate and provided uh, immense help and support during uh, this pandemic uh, in terms of printing in a different critical components for uh, PPEs and the life-saving uh, components. You know. So there are a number of uh, potential uh, benefits of uh, using uh, additive manufacturing uh, technologies. So uh, you have obviously the, you know, if things are done right, and you, know, you can have lower cost by using fewer processing steps or short production time. You can also have uh, components with the tolerable composition and properties, like you can make hybrid system, you can make high multifunctional materials, and uh, it can also provide some ease in terms of fabrication and manufacturing because you can make simplified uh, process and materials. You can also make custom made and complex geometries. But uh, one thing I would like to point out that uh, it, there is an interdisciplinary approach uh, needed to address a number of uh, complex additive manufacturing challenges. So since I talked uh, in the last slide about the uh, lower cost, uh, but I would like to also mention that the, the cost of the product is going to depend on the, how much is the volume. And this is uh, one of the chart by Dr. Oji who provided me kindly. So you basically can see here if you, you compare this additive technology to some type of injection molding type processes, you basically have a smaller, uh, like you can prototype things much easily. You, know, you can have much design and develop new types of parts and new configurations. And you can have a small productions in terms of the batches. But if you, if you have to make a lot of parts um, and the production quantities are large, still you may end up uh, using an injection molding that might be much more uh, economical. 
So there is always a trade-off uh, what you are really looking and you know, what is the part count and you know, how much is the cost you really are looking you know, for each product. So one of the key challenge in uh, additive manufacturing uh, technology is uh, how do you densify the part? So that uh, uh, answer is actually fairly well known in the polymer and metal uh, AM community. But in ceramics, uh, still it is quite uh, challenging and we are all trying to address. So for example, uh, if you look at the polymer uh, as well as metal systems, you can use the approach like melting and certification approaches and obviously depending on the temperature of the metal, uh, temperature of the polymers, you know, there are a number of routes you, know, you can take. But in uh, ceramics, the melting and solidification is not uh, very practical, it's not good. So we have to come up with some type of sintering or densification approach. It, either it could be like sintering approach or it could be uh, some kind of infiltration and heat treatment type approaches. And that actually complicates uh, things you know, much further and, and, and kind of takes you no know, long time you know, to basically make the parts. So since we have done a lot of work uh, in the area of additive uh, manufacturing of polymers and PMCs uh, for multifunctional applications, uh, I would like to take a couple of moments and just uh, show you some parts uh, which were printed and we basically tested and characterized them. So you see there, there is engine panel access door and there are engine inlet guide vanes from uh, ABS and Ultem 1000 uh, polymers and there are reports out and we have done testing on those uh, and you know in uh, in the rig there are acoustic liners uh, to reduce the noise the lightweight structures uh, different kind of uh, uh, geometry like acoustic treatment panels with different kind of porous structures as well as uh, it was interesting that uh, a couple of years ago, summer students uh, even they 3D printed a printer from uh, the, the lab printers as well. So it's kind of pretty exciting uh, uh, area to basically talk about, but uh, I think in the rest of time, I will not get into too much into this particular field. So another area where we did a uh, lot of work is on the 3D printing of uh, cellulose containing filaments where you can uh, print uh, wood containing preform or cellulose containing preforms and convert them to carbon and uh, ceramics. So typically in this case, uh, you have the wood filaments, so you just 3D print a porous disc or dense disc uh, or dense part. And we had dip coated that in polycarbosylene solution, then we heat treated that in 400 degrees C in argon. And then again, deep coated again in PCS solution exposed to like 1000 degrees C in argon and then paralyzed at 1450 degrees C. And this uh, you can see from the bottom left corner, you start with the, the porous disc, which is wood color, and then it has up to the pyrolysis, it has it retains like 35% of the weight. Then uh, we do the another deep coating and do the pyrolysis and heat treatment retains you know, roughly half of the weight. So it's good for making porous structures, but at the same time, uh, you can also you know, functionalize these and trying to use it for different applications. I also just want to let all of you know that this is not the disc uh, on the left, lower left corner, which basically became the disc, uh, the part in the right corner at the piece. There were different pieces, you know, because we were cutting and trying to characterize them as well. Now I'd like to move on to additive manufacturing of uh, fiber reinforced uh, ceramic matrix composites. As uh, those of you who are involved in this uh, particular field uh, can attest that this is fairly complicated and difficult system to really process by additive manufacturing uh, approach. So I would like to make some uh, comments about uh, uh, challenges in additive manufacturing of CMCs. As uh, those of us who have been involved in the CMC field, uh, we know that uh, in the conventional manufacturing, you can make parts in small volumes, which are pretty time consuming and expensive to produce. Complex shapes are always issues to make. Uh, you have to design different kind of molds and try to figure out the tolerances. 
and the manufacturing of uh, multifunctional parts are challenging and of course so there have been a lot of work done in this area which we are basically using a number of parts made with the cmc's in the additive area you can uh, use a smaller number of parts uh, and you, but you can manufacture them rapidly and very cost effectively molds are not required and you can use different design without you know, having a, incurring a major cost and parts with a significant geometric complexity can be done of course in this area there are a number of folks and number of groups who are very actively involved but uh, the bottom line is in both of these approaches uh, either you make the cmc's by conventional approach or additive approach there are the material and process challenges are the same and so in terms of the densification in terms of process modeling and mechanical behavior and the all the property databases so you really need to uh, figure out you know what is really going on because uh, the uh, even if you make material by uh, additive you still you have to go through a lot of those challenges so i would like to give a, a quick overview of the current uh, approaches for the manufacturing of uh, cmc's so obviously everything starts with making some type of preform and applying the interface and then in terms of the matrix densification either you use the chemical vapor infiltration process which is fairly slow and large objects uh, can take weeks to months or you do polymer infiltration and pyrolysis process where you typically have multiple steps to achieve dense matrix or you do the melt infiltration process where you basically infiltrate uh, silicon or some silicon based alloy and react with carbon to form silicon carbide plus other refractory carbides or silicide phases and then there are hybrid processes uh, where you basically have a combination of cvi pip cvimi ppmi to create a silicon carbide based matrix of course there also you need to have several steps uh, to make a matrix and then uh, you get to all the post processing and non destructive evaluation where there is machining and joining and coating and finishing and nd and all the other secondary processes uh, so but uh, even a lot of these preforming uh, techniques and tooling they are all uh, done more or less by hand so it is basically manual process and it is fairly time consuming so about 10 years ago i had my first project uh, funded through nasa learn program on the laminated object manufacturing of ceramic matrix composites uh, specifically uh, silicon carbide uh, fiber reinforced silicon carbide composites so the goal was just to evaluate uh, is a lam a viable option for manufacturing of uh, these type of composites uh, but we immediately ran into an issue with the vendor base for the laminated object manufacturing machines because uh, there is not many machines available uh, and the vendors available in the in the that space but the process itself uh, is uh, like they're listed here you know you basically have a cad design you can make the part and and design it uh, and then turn into computer generated cross sections then you basically have uh, these uh, uh, preforms uh, or adhesive coated materials so they basically kind of pass through heated roller laser cuts the cross sections and laser cross hatches in a non part areas and then you know platform basically layer moves down and then the fresh sheet moves over the platform and then you basically keep on stacking the layers uh, to make the desired shapes so as uh, many of you know since these uh, fibers are very expensive and uh, this machine uh, even there are some available with some uh, universities and some other places is extremely expensive to use uh, with a large volume of fibers so what we try to do is uh, try to uh, develop different technology and try to see that you know how can we really integrate it so in this uh, case uh, the development of new cmc prepreg material uh, became a really a critical step so this slide shows uh, how we uh, try to come up with uh, compositional design of uh, prepreg uh, material Uh, which can yield uh, high amount of silicon carbide uh, which is needed for the ditto manufacturing so if you look on the left side uh, we had used different types of carbon carbon sources uh, solid liquid 
silicon carbide there is also we studied the effect of uh, particle size and uh, micro and nano sizes then in silicon uh, which was also filled in that uh, paste or in that uh, starting material there was a, we studied the particle size effect and weight per percent effect and then there were a number of surface modifiers you know, in terms of surfactants, dispersants, and uh, coupling uh, agents. So what we found by doing these uh, uh, different uh, uh, developments is uh, all these compositions after the paralysis uh, show a very high yield of silicon carbide. So if you look on the right side uh, of some of these uh, compositions in the weight percent uh, you can see very high amount of silicon carbide and the amount of carbon is very, very small, which is unreacted carbon and the silicon in some cases is very, very low as well. So we do uh, heat treat these things up to 1450 degrees C, which is typically the temperature you really need you know, to convert uh, silicon and carbon to silicon carbide. And that's typical temperature used for even silicon infiltration as well. We do see some vaporization of silicon in the vacuum due to its uh, high vapor pressure as well. So the other challenge was what happens, uh, how do these uh, silicon carbide fabrics and prepreks uh, react with the, uh, the laser? So we had a laser system in our lab. So we made uh, six inch by six inch uh, prepreks and a number of them. And we were just trying to optimize them uh, by the, in the laser cutting process in terms of the power and uh, you know this uh, uh, argon flow. So you see here in the left, uh, this is the prepreg material with a lot of disc cut in, and the one in the right, uh, you basically have uh, uh, you know this uh, prepreg, you know, which had couple of inch by couple of inch cut in for the processing. And this, uh, the laser system uh, we used uh, that is, uh, is like two 60 watt laser heads uh, and which has a work area of about 32 inches by 18 inch. So on this chart, you see what uh, really happens uh, with the uh, laser cutting. So this is uh, what you are seeing is a high nickel and S5 furnace satin fabric and the pre -prick. So on the top, you have the fabrics. So they were cut using like 15% power with 1% speed uh, and the no purge. Uh, and uh, the, in the right, you have the same uh, power and the speed uh, with the argon purge. And you can see on the right side, you know, due to the argon purge, you know, like some of the vaporized material actually went on and deposited on those surfaces. In the pre uh, we kind of went down in terms of power and we use like 12% power with 1% speed and no purge. And the surfaces were fairly you know, clean. And then again, uh, you see the 12% power and 1% uh, speed. And again, that is with a no purge. So there have been a lot of uh, optimization in terms of the speed of the uh, laser, the power, and you know, what really we see, you know, how clean the laser cuts these you know, prefix. So the next step was to take these uh, laser cut prepreks and trying to make uh, green uh, preforms. You know? So we basically try to use eight layers of prepreks, which were one pressed uh, to 75 to 85 degrees C. And then uh, they were um, uh, pyrolyzed and then uh, silicon infiltrated for 1475 degrees C for 30 minutes. You know? so, so the point uh, here I would like to make it, we had a you know, fairly dense matrix. You know, so there is no porosity and you have you know, very good uh, carbon and silicon carbide. Of course, these fibers were not uh, coated. So due to the silicon infiltration, uh, of course, you have a reaction uh, with the fibers uh, uh, as well. But uh, this pre pre composition was fairly uh, good and useful uh, to basically make a you know, dense uh, composite. So the other uh, step uh, we also did was just trying to, out of curiosity, see that uh, if we can uh, get, uh, design the composition and not use even um, any kind of uh, silicon infiltration, and that will basically uh, give you an option, even if you have very thin fiber coatings, you, know, you might be able to you know, protect uh, the fibers. So in this case, uh, we had these uh, the eight layers of prepreks. You know, they again warm pressed, and you can see a pretty good distribution of uh, silicon carbide uh, among those fibers. And on the bottom left, uh, even you see 
if uh, we just use the heat treatment uh, without any silicon, additional silicon there, you can see where still all those fibers are intact. So that basically uh, tells uh, that uh, you can use this process uh, and if you can design the composition properly, you basically will be able to use very thin fiber coatings and get a very good uh, uh, silicon carbide and silicon carbide uh, you know, set, uh, plus silicon dense matrix. So now I'd like to talk about uh, binder jetting uh, the two manufacturing of uh, silicon carbide uh, materials. In this area, we have uh, done some work uh, in the last few years and still there are some ongoing programs. Uh, where we are trying to make uh, silicon carbide for uh, different applications. So I would like to make a few points about the binder jetting process. Uh, uh, we have uh, X months in event system in the lab. Uh, actually, the previous work few years ago we did uh, with uh, some uh, other industrial partners. Uh, they had some young flex machines. So typically in this process, uh, as all of you know, there is a inkjet like printing head which moves across a bed of powders and deposits a liquid in a binding material in the shape of the object cross section. Uh, actually earlier uh, this machine used to be coming up with the aqueous binders but nowadays you know we can use uh, phenolic binders and aqueous binders both. And uh, the way it uh, works is uh, here shown in this uh, cartoon as well as in this uh, um, uh, chart, bubble chart here. You basically have a powder stock and then you spread the powder and the binders jets it and then you build platform kind of descents and so you basically have you know the parts you know kind of going down and then you know building this platform you know, is going up. We have done a number of complex shapes in the previous programs. You know, and as well as we have also looked at uh, if you can add small uh, chopped fibers. Actually, these were uh, fibers uh, about 70, 80 micron long. You know, so this is basically you can see there are long fibers in which can also be you know uh, added uh, in the powder mix. So when we started this work uh, about uh, six, seven years ago, first time. We uh, were basically using uh, some very regular shaped uh, silicon carbide powders. Uh, they were uh, basically the carburex powders. And uh, you see here uh, some of the uh, microstructures of those powders and powder shapes and sizes. And actually, there is a, we used to also infiltrate uh, uh, these preforms. Uh, with the uh, SMP10, uh, which is the pre ceramic polymer, just to provide little strength. So, this is not the densified material, but it is basically to provide some strength so that parts can be moved from you know, one facility to the other facility. So, in this slide, you can see uh, different views of uh, CMC uh, uh, coupon, uh, which had roughly 35 volume percent silicon carbide fiber loading. And it was infiltrated uh, multiple times with uh, smaller silicon carbide powders as well as uh, SMP10. And you see there are different uh, constituents there. There is, of course, the original silicon carbide powder. There is a fiber there. There are silicon carbide uh, which are produced by the infiltration process. So there's some added materials. You know, so that basically gives you the complexity of the microstructure which you basically can get. Uh, in uh, de densifying uh, these parts. On the right side, there are some parts you know, which were uh, made you know, using uh, these type of uh, compositions. This slide, you see the uh, density versus the number of uh, infiltration in these uh, printed uh, materials. And you can see density starts going up when you start infiltrating with the pre-ceramic polymer with some kind of uh, silicon carbide mixture. We had done uh, these infiltrations up to like five infiltration in this particular uh, uh, case, and we had gotten density up to 2.6, uh, 2.5. In some recent work, we had gotten up to 2.75 uh, in that range. But if you really want to have a completely dense material, then uh, the other choice is you know you can go and do the melt infiltration by silicon or some silicon alloy, and you can get fairly dense uh, silicon carbide. 
but the application which we are looking of course we didn't want to have you know, a lot of uh, free uh, silicon uh, in the in the material uh, on the right side you see it's, it gives you some idea about how this uh, microstructure is a silicon carbide powder loaded uh, smp 10 polymer the, the different kind of uh, uh, small phases you know they form and you have a site of fibers uh, and again, the microstructure is in a fairly complex. What we found that uh, you can look from this um, uh, uh, mechanical test data that uh, adding uh, the fibers uh, in the silicon carbide uh, does improve the, uh, their strain to failure and uh, provide you higher stresses. And of course, uh, this material system is not completely dense. Uh, still there is some porosity and I think a lot of other uh, activities and other efforts you know, could be done to make it a fully dense material. But the point here is uh, having these fibers uh, added during this uh, process uh, is kind of very beneficial uh, to the overall uh, behavior of this composite. So the previous efforts basically uh, with those uh, irregular shape powders, uh, we were not able to get very high uh, packing densities. So what we thought that uh, maybe try to get into this different types of powders uh, and uh, see if we can increase the powder bed density and therefore the center density uh, as well as try to do some modeling and analysis of powder packing and try to verify by experiments uh, which is uh, going to be pretty critical. So you see on the right side, and obviously the idea is, you know, if you got uh, these different particles, uh, large particles, then you have these small, like kind of bimodal or trimodal particles. If you can mix them and try to get as much high uh, initial density as possible during the processing. And uh, we had used uh, this uh, modeling methodology in terms of the you know, linear packing model and uh, the other one was the packing model for irregular powders, uh, which is basically by modify the interaction functions. So I will not uh, uh, get into a lot of detail about the whole uh, modeling process. Actually, that has been published in a paper which just came out a uh, few months ago. But I would like to show you some uh, CM images of uh, uh, coarse and fine-grained uh, uh, silicon carbide powders. And uh, based on those uh, uh, models, uh, we basically try to mix uh, these powders in different uh, ratios. And if you look on the right side, uh, there is, uh, uh, of course, the tap density result from modeling and experimental methods. So the tap density, according to these uh, two models, uh, which basically uh, using uh, a spherical model and using the regular model, you know, that's fairly uh, consistent and especially using the regular uh, uh, these uh, shapes you now. And uh, what we then uh, did was uh, try to use the, the same uh, fraction of uh, coarse and fine powders and try to you know, make uh, some materials, you know, roughly around 75-25% uh, uh, powders. One critical point I would like to make here is the silicon carbide powder blend optimization is very critical in getting initial high density of binder jetted parts. So, for example, if you look at on the left side, uh, there is a, a particle size distribution of uh, unimodal and bimodal uh, powders. Basically, this is the composition which came out of the modeling roughly around 76, uh, 24. And when we use these powders to print uh, silicon carbide plates, so we do see improvement about four to five percent uh, improvement in the green densities. And the reason you can see why uh, that is happening because you basically have in those big gaps, you know, those small powders are basically filling up. Uh, so ideally, it will be ideal to have even trimodal powders, but again, then you have to, uh, you are also fighting with the certain things in the process, and you know, because there are certain types of powders which can be used, and otherwise you start facing another processing challenges. You know. So that has to be optimized uh, 
what is the machine capable of handling and how far you can go with this uh, particle size distribution. So here I would like to show some highlights of uh, uh, use of binder jetting process in uh, uh, 3D printing of uh, iron based uh, soft magnetic materials and then you can see you can use this approach uh, to 3D print uh, uh, different types of uh, soft magnetic uh, composite materials. Uh, and uh, one of our student, and you know, he has done a wonderful job in, in uh, kind of printing them. And then there is a, he optimized the centering profiles and and trying to get the magnetic properties uh, of uh, these uh, materials. On the right side, uh, we have also always been looking into using some of these metallic parts uh, for different applications, either as a prototype or in the real applications. And uh, I will not uh, spend a lot of time or get into a lot more details you know, on those. And this is just you know, shown uh, like for your information. So in the last part of my presentation, I would like to uh, show some examples of uh, the two manufacturing of uh, multi-materials. So as you know, there is a lot of interest in uh, urban air mobility. Uh, these days uh, in terms of sustainable transportation and infrastructure, and uh, there are uh, different kinds of aircrafts uh, be being developed. Uh, uh, also, there are some uh, uh, smaller aircraft for carrying, uh, carrying people from you know, point A to point B in, in small cities, just like in you know, Uber, uh, as well as uh, all these uh, you know, like, um, uh, different types of uh, uh, efforts you know, going on. Uh, in this uh, area by you know uh, air transportation to car transportation so one of the area which we have been uh, involved uh, last uh, year or so is the design and manufacturing of uh, engineered uh, three dimensional uh, battery electrodes uh, which can enhance the power density by increasing the surface area as well as uh, specific energy density by increasing the number of layers uh, per current collector area and these are for urban air mobility and electrified aircraft propulsion. And uh, the goal is here to develop uh, a stable high power density battery cells for UM and all other electric aircraft applications. On the right side, you see some of the electrodes that are getting printed and characterized. So it is pretty exciting uh, field to basically get into the battery area and trying to make uh, the contribution from the additive manufacturing technology. So next couple of slides I would like to show. In order to make a component, you really need to integrate a number of additive manufacturing technologies. So this project which finished last year was basically a multi-center project as well as a number of other organizations and the goal was to make uh, uh, additively manufactured uh, electric motors. So you can see here, uh, there is already, there was a baseline motor uh, like uh, shown here on the bottom left. We, there was a new design for uh, this new motor and then these uh, things were tested uh, uh, in the, our uh, dynamometer facility at uh, and, just a simple primer on the motors. Uh, as you know, many motors uh, are basically made uh, by hand and uh, you have basically radial flux motor, you have axial flux motor. And uh, uh, this uh, company, uh, launch point, uh, they also make uh, axial flux motor, but they have some kind of improvements in terms of the leads wire uh, uh, windings. So this chart shows what is the baseline motor and, and how it basically looks in terms of the X-ray tomography and the testing. And um, uh, this motor itself uh, is uh, it has a state of the art due to its uh, compact design and the high power density and the Halbach array of uh, magnets. It is roughly around seven and a half inches in diameter, about four pounds, roughly about 1.8 kilograms in weight. So what we thought about uh, in this uh, uh, work was basically working on the stator and the magnets, the rotor, the housing, 
and uh, you can see on the right side there were two approaches for making the stators uh, as well as there was iron core stator with the direct printed coils uh, which were basically we were using silver there were insulators there were sharp magnets and then on the right side you see is the rotor which was also 3d printed actually and uh, there is of course the permanent magnet and then high strength structure which is basically the metallic and in the bottom left uh, you basically have the whole assembled motor so you basically have a hybrid and am approaches and for these all these you know, am components which are critical so we did the direct printing of silver rings uh, for uh, in, in place of the copper uh, and uh, you can see on the right side there are a lot of silver rings available and of course copper has a lot of challenges in if you want to 3d print it uh, but uh, silver you basically can print it very easily and we had a number of activities in investigating thermal stability of these inks and pastes for these direct printed applications. You can see here silver inks were printed in this Aniscript printer and of course we had to characterize their electrical resistance, their thermal stability and then uh, measure the conductivity and then try to down select uh, what is the material and we want to use uh, going forward and uh, we basically uh, uh, use uh, Hiraeus paste uh, for uh, going forward because it provided the highest temperature option in this. So in this system uh, using uh, new components uh, uh, they do provide a lot of benefit so you basically have uh, a direct printed stator uh, with high temperature capability, improved cooling and high conductor packing and iron for higher torque. And then from structural optimization, you can reduce the mass and do the innovative cooling from housing, rotors and stator ring components. And then um, uh, there was another uh, route taken uh, to make this winding as well uh, through copper wire embedding at uh, uh, UTEP. Uh, that can basically provide the benefit in terms of time and uh, labor. So in this uh, slide I would like to show you uh, the baseline uh, performance of uh, the motor versus uh, the motor where a number of parts were printed by uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, so you look at uh, the baseline motor uh, the specific power is roughly 4 kilowatt per kilogram in these both of these new concepts they they are higher like 5.3 kilowatt and 7 kilowatt so the the the, the additive manufacturing was able to provide a lot of benefit in terms of you know, designing part and you know, reducing the footprint and that is basically providing a maximum power uh, as well as maximum torque and the power density uh, in uh, this type of application. Uh, of course, uh, it was not one type of additive manufacturing, but there were a number of additive manufacturing approaches used. But uh, it's pretty exciting uh, to see that uh, combination of these uh, in a component can provide you uh, these kind of benefits. Finally, to summarize and conclude my talk, uh, I hope uh, I was able to convince you that uh, additive manufacturing can offer uh, significant uh, advantages over uh, traditional manufacturing uh, techniques. And uh, this technology can be selectively applied to traditional components, uh, but can also enable uh, new applications. Uh, but uh, uh, I feel very strongly that multi-material printing approach uh, could provide new opportunities uh, to explore and expand the design envelope. Uh, and the AM technologies uh, are potentially game changing. Uh, they are disrupting global supply chains and uh, will enable the sustainable development uh, in the future. So finally, I would like to acknowledge a number of my colleagues and collaborators over the last decade or so. And I must apologize to anyone if I forgot about them. 
at least from uh, Nasa Glenn, uh, Michael Big, uh, Craig Smith, uh, Amjad, uh, John, uh, Dr. Grady, uh, as well as many other colleagues from different centers, uh, Dr. Dilip Singh and uh, Banchadu from Argan National Lab, uh, Professor Rajit Gupta, uh, Greg Piper, uh, Dan Gorikan, Ron Phillips, and Dan Seinman, and many industrial collaborators, and a number of my summer interns over the last 10 years who are really working in this area, and they all have gone to bigger and better things. Uh, and I really uh, appreciate their help. They always uh, came to us and challenged us uh, about their ideas and trying to uh, do things uh, their way as well as you know, trying to work together. So I really appreciate uh, all of them and thank uh, everyone. And I would like to thank all of you for your uh, attention and uh, I will be very happy to answer any questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dr. Singh for presenting this very informative lecture. Dr. Singh, it is my great pleasure to present you with the 2020 American Ceramic Society Edward Otton Jr. Memorial Lecture Certificate of Appreciation, which will be mailed to you. Thank you again for the wonderful lecture.